Hey guys, Mike here, the Detroit Borg, with a look at the new Galaxy S5, which is now slightly larger at 5.1 inches, has a fingerprint scanner for unlocking the device, also has a heart rate monitor underneath the camera on the back, also has a new 16 megapixel camera, good for 4K video recording, and is IP67 certified, so that means it's dust and water resistant. So you could submerge this in one meter of water for up to 30 minutes. So we're gonna actually test that in this video. All right, so in terms of specs, I'm actually using the SMG900H version, which is the version sold in Latin America. So this means I have the Exynos Octa-Core processor, but most people will get the version with the Snapdragon 801 processor, which is a quad-core processor. The Exynos is an octa-core processor, so it combines two quad-cores, 1.9 gigahertz quad-core Cortex A15 and a 1.3 gigahertz Cortex A9. All right, so this has two gigs of RAM, just like last year. Uh, also, it comes with 16 gigs of storage and it does have a few other storage options, but you can use the micro SD card slot to expand storage all the way up to 128 gigs and you can load apps on that card thanks to TouchWiz. So there is a new version of TouchWiz with this. So let's go ahead and unbox this thing. I'm just going to crack the lid here. Now, as you can see, I have the white version, but this is available in black, uh, gold, as well as blue, and I'm sure other colors are coming. Uh, we're going to set that aside for just a minute while we take a look at the accessories. So again, SMG900H, quick start guide. So we have our Samsung in-ear headphones with the inline mic and volume controller. They also give us additional ear tips if you want to find the ones that fit your ears. And then we also have our Samsung USB wall adapter for charging. Now we should also find our USB charging cable. Now in this case, it's a USB 2.0 cable. So they did not give us the USB 3.0 cable that this device actually supports. So that's kind of interesting. All right, we also have our battery tucked in here. Pull that out. So once again, this battery is 2800 milliamp hours and it also integrates the NFC technology as well. All right, so let's take the plastic off our GS5. So we got a little label back here. There we go, we have that new back panel which Samsung calls Modern Glam. You can see it kind of has a shimmery quality to it. It actually kind of looks gold when I look at it right now. I'm not sure if that's being picked up on the camera, but it's not quite that white color. It's got a pearlescent color to it. I also have a label on the front protecting the screen. And I see we have one more piece of plastic covering the camera lens. And we have another piece of plastic covering the door for the USB 3.0 port. All right, so the first thing I wanna do is install our battery. So I'm gonna use this little thumbnail port here for popping off the back panel. Now, if you look at the inside of the battery cover, you'll see part of that IP67 certification, which is the seal that goes around the internals of the chassis here. It seals in the battery as well as the other sensitive parts that you don't want exposed to water. Now, as you can see, we have our combination micro SD and SIM slot. This is a micro SIM, not a nano SIM. So you do have to install your SIM first. You can also install your SD card slot right on top of that. So let's go ahead and pop this in. Now, wireless charging is available here, but you do have to buy the accessory, which is a kit, which I will plan on reviewing at a later date. Now, down here, we have our waterproof speaker, which, as you can see, is not sealed up with the cover. All right, so I'm going to pop on the back panel. It snaps into place. All right, so let's go ahead and boot this up for the first time. So we get a new Samsung splash screen and animation. All right, so let's take a look at the design of the GS5, which is pretty familiar. Uh, the big difference here is the back panel, which Samsung is calling modern glam. Now, basically, that's referring to the soft touch material along the back, which has this sort of golf ball-like texture to it with this pearlescent finish, which differs, of course, depending on what color you get. It seems to be more noticeable on the blue color, but as you can see, it kind of does a nice job picking up the light. Gives you a little more design and material interest here. So we have a little bump out here for your loudspeaker here, prevents you from accidentally covering up the speaker when you lay it flat on a table. Toward the top, you'll find your Samsung branding along with that 16 megapixel camera module, uh, which also has your LED flash right below that, as well as your heart rate monitor, which includes an LED light, as well as a sensor for picking up your heart rate, which we'll demonstrate in this video. Now, as you see, this camera kind of sticks out. It does support 4K video recording. Unfortunately, that does not include optical image stabilization. Now along the side, you'll find that chrome finish, and if you compare this to the GS4, you can see they've changed the design a bit from this brushed metal to this nice shiny chrome finish, which gives you a little more of a jeweled effect. You also have your sleep-wake button, 
which appears to be slightly smaller on the GS5. You also have your thumbnail port for popping open the GS5 and GS4 in the same location. Toward the bottom, you see, of course, a difference here. You have your flap covering the USB port, and of course, this is USB 3.0 versus USB 2.0. So you pop this off, let's see if we can pop it off. So if you pop it off again, you see the USB 3.0 port is larger. You also have your microphone in the same location. Along the right-hand side, you'll find your volume rocker again in the same location. Now along the top, they switch things around a bit. So we have our headphone jack on one side versus the other side. Same with the IR blaster. We also have our pinhole mics on the same side here next to the IR blaster versus next to the headphone jack. Now the GS5 has cleaned things up a bit here. So we have these two sensors, ambient light sensor and proximity sensor, along with an sRGB sensor built into these sensors, along with our camera module, which is in the same location, front facing camera, good for 1080p video, while the GS5 GS4 had uh, three sensors. So one of them was sRGB, one was proximity sensor, one was an ambient light sensor. So they've cleaned it up a bit. Now you can see that the earpiece is a bit smaller on the GS5 versus the GS4. Now toward the bottom, we also have new Android controls here. So we now have our recent apps button and a back button versus a menu button and a back button on the GS4. Now the home button is also different here. So we now have a fingerprint sensor or fingerprint scanner built into the home button, which you swipe on to unlock versus the standard home button on the the GS4. Now the interesting thing here is that it looks like there's no visual cue that tells you that this is a fingerprint sensor, so it's almost completely invisible. Now if you look at the GS4 versus the GS5, it looks like the LED flash was a bit bigger than on the GS5, but it appears there is no difference in terms of overall performance. Now let's take a look at the size difference between the GS5 and the GS4. So on the right we have the GS4, which as you can see is thinner and smaller than the GS5. Now the GS5 is 5 inches, this is 5.1 inches, so it looks like the device itself, the bezel around the display, has increased in size exponential to the display itself. So they've increased the bulk of the phone to accommodate more features, a larger battery, as well as the display. Now for the first part of this video, I just want to cover some of the major new features or the major hallmark features with the Galaxy S5, and then we'll get into the extreme details of what's new. So first up is the fingerprint sensor, which again is integrated into the home button. Now it's not active by default. In fact, it doesn't even train you when you activate the device for the first time. So in order to activate it, you have to go to settings. So I'm going to go up here to settings for my drop down notification shade, go to fingerprint scanner and go to fingerprint manager. So basically all I have to do is train one of my fingers. I'm just going to use my index finger right now and go through the setup process. So this is very similar to the setup process on the iPhone 5S, but the technology is very different. We're using a swipe gesture as opposed to an image sensor. Uh, which actually images your finger. This is actually detecting the uh, capacitive characteristics of your finger as opposed to the image of your finger. Now I have to set up a password. So I'm gonna use one with a letter, click continue, do it again. So if the fingerprint sensor fails, what you would have to do is enter in your password. Now if you go to the lock screen now, you get this little indicator telling us to swipe across the lock screen to unlock it. And of course it only works with the finger you train. So for example, I use another finger here tells me select the entire pad. And if I keep doing that and it fails enough times, it will prompt me to enter in my password. Now I think most people would prefer to use their thumb to unlock their device. So let me go ahead and train my thumb and I think there's a trick in order to train the thumb so you can actually do this one handed. So I'm gonna go back to settings, I'm gonna go back to finger scanner, go back to fingerprint manager. I have to swipe my index finger to make changes and I'm gonna go ahead and add another finger. Click OK. So I'm gonna train my thumb in the position I would normally use it to unlock it. Kind of the side position. And as you can see, if you don't quite make a, a full swipe, it will tell you to re-swipe your finger. So now if I go to my lock screen, swipe down, you can see it actually works. Now admittedly, this technique isn't as reliable as using the full finger swipe. Now the next feature I wanna highlight is built into the S Health app, which is the heart rate monitor. So as you can see, when you click start, all I have to do is tap your finger to the sensor on the back, it lights up automatically for you and begins measuring your heart rate. There you go, 82 beats per minute. If you want to reset it, click start. Again, press your finger to the back, lights up for you, begins measuring. 92 beats per minute. So let's try again one more time. There we go. 
Now the other big feature here is the IP67 certification, which means this device has been designed to resist water and dust. In fact, if we look at the flap here covering the USB port, you'll see that it's actually lined in rubber to seal out water and dust. In fact, when you charge this device and pull out the charger, you'll actually get a little reminder telling you to make sure that that flap is completely closed for water resistance. Now this also means that exposed elements like the speaker and headphone jack are also waterproof as is the earpiece which may account for the fact that the earpiece seems to be a bit smaller. Now I'm just going to do a quick demo of the water resistant capability of this phone. Now you should keep in mind that this phone is not waterproof meaning you can't just go swimming with it in your pocket, you can't use it in the shower. It's really meant for emergency situations. So for example if you drop it in the sink while you're cleaning dishes or if you drop it in the toilet or if you are sweating while working out or if it's raining or if you drop it in the puddle or something like that, you don't have to worry about this phone necessarily being damaged in that event. So if you can quickly take it out you're fine. Uh, but uh, uh, this one can be submerged under three meters of water for up to 30 minutes and you can really push it if you really test it out but really it's meant for emergency situations now you can't use the display when it's submerged in water and the speakers are muffled but everything else seems to work and it's really there just to keep the phone from being damaged so I think one of the other major new features here is Ultra Power Saving Mode, which is debuting with the GS5. We really haven't seen something quite like this before. It's not just a simple power saving mode. Now it's giving you an estimate when I activate this feature. It gives me an estimate that with 50% battery life in Ultra Power Saving Mode, I can get 6.2 days out of this phone. So it reduces performance, including the display. So change it to a grayscale display. Allows me to make phone calls, text messages, and even browse the web and some additional apps. And I'll show you exactly how this works. So if we enable this, it's going to change the state of the phone to enable ultra power save mode. So it's dialing back performance by uh, closing apps, changing the launcher, that sort of thing. And with an OLED display, if you're not powering the pixel, it's not lit, so you're saving power. So if you have a black background, none of those pixels are being powered, just the pixels needed for these icons and the text. So that dramatically improves performance. So as you can see, we have a phone dialer here, which resembles the phone dialer we're familiar with. You also have your messaging app. Again, same thing, just dialed back for performance. So you can see the colors are, are just gray. We also have an internet browser. So we can browse the internet. So it's a full browser here. So you can dial in any website you want. You can go right to Google. So the experience is the same, it's just in grayscale. Now you can add additional apps here which are restricted and also performance of the touch display seems to be reduced. It seems to be less sensitive. So you can add a calculator, you can add the chat on app, clock, Google+, memo, Twitter, and voice recorder. And that's about all. So if you want to disable this, go to the drop down notification sheet which is also kind of simplified here. You can also go your, to your settings which also has an adjusted interface in ultra power saving mode. But you can quickly disable this feature by hitting it right there and it brings it back to normal. All right, so let's take a look at the user interface starting with the lock screen. So as you can see with the lock screen, you get a new unlock effect here, the new sound effect. It takes you directly to your home screen or where you last left off. And you can see that the interface is pretty familiar, but let's jump back to that lock screen to show you that we also get our date and time as well as some weather information. You can also quickly launch the camera right from that lock screen. Now let's take a quick look at that home screen. So as you can see, the experience is pretty familiar. You have your weather and clock widget up top. You have your Google search bar right there. In fact, you can say, okay, Google, to activate the feature. We're not gonna explore that just at this minute. Now you can edit your home screens by pinching in and out. And as you can see, you have the option to add additional home screens or select which one you want to be the home screen by tapping the home icon up here. You can also drag and drop any one of these to your trash can. Now you can also add your widgets and under here you can see that they've organized widgets a bit better. So for example, we now have kind of a foldering option. So for example, if widgets come in different sizes, they're all grouped together for you. And then we have search widgets. So for example, if you just don't wanna keep swiping between all your widgets, you can just go ahead and search for them directly. You can also set your wallpapers from here as well. And you can go to home screen settings to change the transition effect of your home screens. Card stack is default, but of course you can turn that off or use 3D rotation. You also have the My Magazine viewer which you can turn off. So let's get to My Magazine. So if we swipe to the left we get to My Magazine which is powered by Flipboard. Now we get these individual tiles here which you can reposition if you want and reorder. 
And these are basically news feeds. So they feed news dependent on the category, such as arts and culture, science and technology. So for example, I can move these around and they just surface the top story here. What they don't allow you to do is swipe between them, swipe between the stories directly in the widget. You actually have to open it up to see it. Now you can also integrate other things here, including Twitter, Google Plus, and YouTube. And all that is down here. So for example, I have my YouTube app. I can see the latest feed for my subscription. I can go up here to change my settings, we get a little settings icon. This allows me to add additional tiles or to remove additional tiles. So for example, I have several categories here which I haven't added, such as music, living, food and dining, today's picks, travel, science and technology, which I did add, but if I want to remove it, all I have to do is uncheck it. Down here I have social, which are apps that can take advantage of this feed. So we have YouTube, Twitter, and Google Plus selected, and of course you can add a few more if you prefer. Now, if you want to access these, you just tap on them. For example, it takes me right to the YouTube Flipboard feed. So again, this is, uh, I've logged into my account and this is my subscription feed. Now, I can also go up here to my settings and I can change what exactly appears under each category. So for example, under uh, tech and science, I can see all of the things that feed directly into that category. So I can see Apple News, apps, gaming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I can also see specific websites such as BGR, uh, digital trends and gadgets. So if I wanna add those to my feed, I can do that. CNN Tech, uh, BGR. Now from this window, I can also post directly to my social network. So I see Twitter selected by default. I can also select Google Plus or I can log into others such as Facebook to post from here. So for example, if I wanna post a tweet, all I have to do is enter it into this text box. I can also search for items. So for example, if I want to search for Android stories, I can just type it in. So if we input Android, you can see we get lots of search results from news sites that feed Android news, such as Android Authority, Flipboard panels that search Android, users by the name of Android, Twitter feeds by the name of Android, RSS feeds, Google+, Plus, uh, YouTube feeds, uh, SoundCloud, uh, other services, Instagram, as well as Flickr, 500 Picks, Tumblr, and more. Now, if you wanna add any of these items to Flipboard, just tap on them, click bookmark, and you're good. Now, if we go to our drop-down notification shade, you can see this has also been slightly redesigned with the circular theme for the quick access toggles. And you can see the ones they've included by default. Now, if you wanna see all of them, just tap up here. It shows you all of those quick access toggles, which shows you just how many features are available here. And if you wanna access the settings for any one of these toggles, just tap and hold on them. It takes you directly to the settings panel, which explores some of those features. Now, Quick Connect is an easy way of accessing all of the devices sharing a wireless network that this device can control. So for example, it sees my Samsung Smart TV here. So I can launch this to get to that TV to, for example, use the Watch On app to control it. I can also go to my printers. So I can see all my printers here. So I can access my printers or send print jobs to those printers, or I can access my AV receiver, which is equipped with wireless DLNA capability. So I can play back music, videos, or even photos. Now S Finder has also been integrated here. This allows you to search the entire device as well as the web for content. So for example, if you search Android, this searches for everything from the browser to my files to events under S Planner, settings, web searches. You can also filter this by, for example, the type of media you want to search for, images, music, or videos, uh, the time frame, such as, for example, past 30 days, past seven days, yesterday, today, or the next seven days in, in the case of an event on your calendar. You can also search by tags and location tags. So there's a lot of search options here. Now, foldering has changed here as well. So as you can see, when you open up the folder, you get this little animation and the icon is different. You can see it actually shows you the first six items in the folder. You can also go up here to edit. So you can change the color of the folder if you want, or you can tap up here to change the name. Now they've made some significant changes to the app drawer. We no longer can pinch in and out to see all of the pages, but you can still use that slider mechanism to slide between them. They give us just two pages of apps and they've refrained from installing all of the apps. In fact, if you go up here, you can actually go to Galaxy Essentials to see all the apps that did not come installed with this device, which historically they've kind of just added, such as the Samsung Watch On app for using the remote control, the uh, Samsung Smart Switch mobile app, the SideSync app, the Samsung Gear app, so you see one for Gear and one for the Fit Manager, S Note, Scrapbook, Samsung Wallet, the S Translator, Story Album, and the Video Editor. So all of those are not pre-installed, but you can download them here. You also have the ability to create a folder. Uh, so for example, I'm just gonna do test like so, and you can go ahead and start adding certain apps to that folder. So let's say we wanna add our YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. So just select those, click done, 
And now we have our little folder here. In fact, we can go up here and change the color if we wish. Now, if you look down here, you can see the action of creating the folder creates another page under the app drawer that is dedicated just toward folders. So if you wanna move this or add it to the home screen, just tap and hold it and drag it to one of the available home screens here like so. Now, if you want to rearrange apps within the app drawer, you actually have to go up here to edit, and then you can start moving them around. So for example, if I want to drop the folder here, I can't. It stays back in this folder page, but I can go ahead and move these apps around like so. Now, if I'm not using that editor, basically when I tap and hold any of these icons, it takes me to the home screen to drop the app. Now, I have several options up here. I can create a new folder. I can go to App Info to see more information about the app. I can disable the app, meaning I can't uninstall this app. If I could uninstall this app, I would see uninstall, or I can cancel. If I go up to App Info, just shows you some information about it. Google search, you can uninstall the updates, you can turn it off, you can force stop it, that sort of thing. Now you can also change the order of these icons. So you can go to view as, you can do custom, which is default, or you can do alphabetical. That also changes the orders in the folders. Now you can also see your downloaded apps and uninstall them if you want. You can select which ones you want to uninstall. You can also uninstall or disable apps and any of the apps that are eligible for disabling or uninstallation are selected here. So you can select certain ones here. You can uninstall that. That one, you can disable that one. So certain ones can be un uninstalled, certain ones just can be disabled. You can also hide apps. So if you just wanna hide apps, if you can't uninstall them, if you can't disable them, et cetera, you can uh, alternatively just hide them from view. Now in terms of the Android keys, we have our home button. If we tap and hold the home button, it takes us to Google Now. And if we double tap the home button, it takes us to S Voice. Now the S Voice interface has also been redesigned. So let's go ahead and test that out. What's the weather like tomorrow? On Wednesday, we'll have some sunshine with a few clouds. Now we also have our recent apps button. So this shows us all of our recent apps. And as you can see, this has also been redesigned a bit. So you can tap on any one of these to get back to them and like so, or you can swipe them out of the way to close them. It looks like you can't, there you go. You can swipe left or right. You can also go to your application manager. So you can see active apps, you can end certain apps, you can end them all. And you can also close them all just by hitting that control right there. Now we also have our back button. Now some of these buttons have dual purposes. So for example, the recent apps button, if you press and hold it, will actually get you to your settings. So as you can see, when you're on home screen, it takes you to your editor for editing your home screens. Now, if you're in another app, let's go to the browser. If you tap and hold that now, you get to your settings. Instead of pressing up here to get to the settings, you can press down here and hold it to get to settings. So that's also a new feature. All right, so let's take a look at the new multi-window mode, which you can invoke just by tapping and holding the back button. So this invokes the multi-window tray, which has all the apps that, support it, that are supported in multi-windowing, such as Chrome and YouTube. So you can drag and drop those icons into the window, and now you have a side-by-side -side viewer, which you can resize. And if you tap on that little circle at the center of it, you can swap between the windows. You can also close one of the windows, or you can copy text from one window to another, or pictures from one window to another. Now, if you add additional apps over one of these apps, let's go ahead and drag and drop uh, Hangouts. And again, if I drag and drop Gmail over here, I can continue doing this, drag and drop more apps over the other app. And then if I go up here to close it, it will reveal the last app I had open. Now, if you minimize this and go to recent apps, you can see when you tap on the apps that were in the multi-window mode, it brings back the multi-window mode. So you don't lose it every time you close it. Now, if you look at the bottom of the tray, you get this little editor here. So if you go to create, you can actually create a custom recipe. So you can see the two apps I have open right now, YouTube and Chrome. If I click OK, you now see that was just added to the top of the tray. Now, if I go to my multi-window mode, tap up here, it automatically launches those two apps for me. Now, I can also go to edit here and add additional apps to this tray. You can see some are not added, such as Google Play Movies. I can just drag and drop it here and reposition them. You can also reposition the other apps. And once you're done, click done. Now, in terms of our app drawer, you can see it's actually pretty sparse. So we have all these Samsung apps, we have all the Google apps, and then we have just a few third-party apps. That includes Flipboard and Dropbox. Of course, Flipboard powers the My Magazine feature, and Dropbox has a partnership with Samsung, so you do get 50 gigs of free storage when you sign up with your Samsung device for the first time. They have redesigned some of the Samsung apps, such as our uh, calculator. Uh, we have a chat-on app, which is Samsung's cross-platform chat app. 
We have a new email app. Of course, we have the standard WebKit browser. We have a new memo app, which has also been cleaned up a bit. We also have a nice file browser. So this gives us access to all of our files, uh, categorized by images, audio, downloaded apps, documents, videos, and recent files. You can see your download history, your device storage, and you can see your Dropbox account as well. So you can go right to your Dropbox from the file manager. We also have a voice recorder, which looks pretty slick. We have our video player, which also has pop-out video playback. So if I play a video here, and I go ahead and hit this pop out. I can now watch the video while doing other things. In fact, I can resize it and that sort of thing. So there you go, resize it, press the home button. Again, this is pretty familiar territory from other Samsung devices. We also have the Samsung App Store. We have our new music player, which is pretty basic here. We have our albums. We can search by tracks and playlist. So for example, if we just wanna play one song here, so you get a pretty basic interface. You can shuffle them. You can skip ahead, you can see uh, the album, and then you can create playlists. You can also send the audio to another device, such as my Samsung Smart TV or my AV receiver, which is equipped with DLNA. Now, as I said, we have an IR blaster up here to control your AV equipment, and they do give us an included app called Smart Remote, which is powered by Peel. Basically, all you do is log in and specify your service provider. So in my case, that's Comcast. So it shows me all my programming, and uh, for example, I can go back to see everything that's on NBC, PBS, ABC. I can see my channel listing. And if I just want to access any one of these, all I have to do is tap on it and click watch now. It sends the code to the TV to change it to that right channel. I can also jump to my remote control here for volume, channel up and down, source. I can go here to select my device. So if I want to control my set top box or my TV box, I can do that as well. And I can add additional equipment or even set up different rooms. If I want to control different rooms with this remote app, I certainly could do that as well. They do not include the watch on app, which has a few additional features, but again, that is under Galaxy Essentials. So if you want to install that, you can. Now, the great thing about that remote control app is that it puts this permanent widget on your lock screen. So you have quick access to it, so you can change your channel, change the volume, uh, turn the TV on and off, same with the set-top box. Now, next up is Kids Mode, which is sort of a launcher that replaces the TouchWiz launcher when you launch it. Now, this is here mostly to prevent kids from accidentally deleting things or ha having access to things you don't want them to have access to. So it's kind of like a sandbox that's behind a passcode. So they can't get out of this without knowing the passcode. In fact, it's geared toward these child-friendly apps for drawing, playing music, playing videos, that sort of thing. All of that is in here. And uh, if you want to get out of here, you have to tap this little island down here and tap in your passcode. And that takes you back to your TouchWiz launcher. Now we also have the S Health app, which integrates that heart rate sensor. So it will monitor your steps, the calories you've burned and your food intake. You have lots of other features here. I'm not going to explore. Uh, you can see your exercise. Uh, you can also add additional apps from the Samsung App Store uh, to integrate with S Health. Now, the best way to explore all the features in the Samsung phone is to go right to settings. And the first thing I want to take a look at are these quick toggles up here. Now, as I said, you can just tap on hold on any one of them to take you directly to the control panel. But you can also edit what appears up here. This also allows me to show you exactly what's in this device. So, of course, we have Wi-Fi. We have GPS location, sound, screen rotation lock. So you can toggle that on and off. As you can see, you just toggle on and off like that. Same with Bluetooth. Bluetooth, mobile data, U power saving mode, which will explore multi window mode, toolbox, and Wi Fi hotspot. Now you can tap this icon up here to see all the widgets. And as you can see, we have more things here, including screen mirroring, which allows you to mirror the device, of the, your Samsung device, directly onto an all cast compatible device like a Samsung Smart TV. We have NFC technology. We can disable syncing. We also have Smart Stay and Smart Pause. Now, Smart Stay basically prevents the display from going to sleep if it detects your eyes are looking at it and we also have smart pause which will pause and resume playback of video again if it detects the presence of your eyes we also have power saving mode which you can enable and if you do so it dials back performance but you have more options here again just by tapping and holding on it, it takes you to this in fact when you turn it on you now have more options here including blocking background data restricting form performance which you can turn on and off and you can enable grayscale mode now we also have blocking mode, which is kind of a do not disturb feature. And when you enable this, you have several options here. You can block incoming calls, turn off all notifications, turn off alarms and timers. You can also set specific times for the do not disturb feature to be activated. And you can allow certain calls to come through. Now we also have car mode. And when you're in car mode, it simplifies the interface and allows you to control it with your voice. So for example, you can stick this on your dashboard and you can say, hi Galaxy, navigate to the nearest gas station. Would you like to navigate to gas station? Yes. 
And of course, with your voice, you can place phone calls, send messages, or read messages, and play music. Now, if you live in a cold climate, we all know that you can't touch the screen with gloved hands and operate it. However, Samsung has enabled a feature here. If we go to settings and enable touch sensitivity, this increases touch sensitivity so you can now use gloves to operate your phone. It's not perfect, so for example, these gloves are still a little too thick to operate it, but I can operate it by touching a little harder. Now, once I disable this feature, no matter how hard I press, I can no longer operate the screen. Now, another new feature here is Toolbox, which brings up this little icon that floats on top of the screen. It stays on screen no matter what you're doing, but it does fade as it kind of times out there. So it's not terribly intrusive. But the idea here is when you tap on it, you get quick access to popular apps or apps you tend to use the most. But you can edit this. So for example, uh, let's see if we want to launch the camera app. There we go, it launches the camera app. And of course, when you're using the toolbox mode with the camera app, it does disappear. But when you press the home button, you'll see it again. And you can launch other apps. Now, if you want to edit this, you can go up to edit or you can remove it just to get rid of it. But if you go up to edit, you can actually edit what appears under that toolbox. So for example, if you want Chrome, you can enable that as well. Uh, unfortunately, I do have to remove one of the apps in order to add Chrome. So let's go ahead and remove the WebKit browser and add Chrome. And we're going to click Save. So when I tap on that, I now have quick access to Chrome. Now, if you tap and hold the power button, you have several options, including power off, airplane mode, restart, emergency mode, mute, vibrate, and sound. Now, emergency mode will explain exactly what this is. Now, this is something you set up under settings, but basically it's intended to help your battery last longer. Send notice of your approximate location to the mobile phone of a chosen contact that you set in advance. That's what you do under settings, and I'll show you exactly where that is. The idea here is if you're in a situation where you can't talk, you can't uh, pick up your phone, or you've crashed or something's going on, this is kind of an option to hopefully get you some help. Now with volume, you have several options here. So if you hit the volume control and hit this gear icon, you can change the volume of the ringtone, your media, your notifications, as well as your system sound. Now let's go ahead and take a look at our all new settings panel, which is quite interesting here. So you can see that everything has been redesigned with this sort of circular icon with these bright, bold colors for easy categorization. But up here, the first category is quick settings. So you can see your quick settings. These are all toggles that you can edit. So these are things you can put to the surface of your settings panel. But if you look down here, you can see that they also appear under these categories for network connections, connect and share, sound and display, personalization, motion, user and backup system, as well as applications. Uh, you can edit this by going up to the editor here. So you can go to edit quick settings and you can specify which ones you want to appear here. Now you're limited to 12. So if you've already have 12, which you do by default, you'll have to remove one or uncheck one in order to add another. But alternatively, you can just search. So for example, if I want to change my display settings, all I have to do is start typing in display and there you go. Now what's a Samsung device without lots of additional options? So you can change your view to list view if you prefer this. Personally, I think I prefer this. I think it's easier to glance at. You also have the tab view, which we're more familiar with, connections, devices, etc. You still get those new icons. Now let's look through some of our settings. Now, as I said, the quick settings are actually redundancies. They appear down here below. They're just kind of put here for quick access. You don't have to scroll through here. So we have our network connections, which includes Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, tethering, and Wi-Fi hotspot. Our location, data usage, airplane mode, as well as more networks. That's where you can set up your APNs. You can also go up here to see one of the other new features here, which is Smart Network Switch, which I have enabled. Now, basically, this is a feature that combines the power of your wireless Wi-Fi connection as well as your cellular connection. So it combines the forces to give you faster download speeds as well as more stable download speeds. So we have NFC technology as well. So you can enable this and allow Android Beam and S Beam to use it. We also have nearby devices. So nearby devices could have access to your Samsung phone for streaming media. You also have your printing services because this is the latest version of Android that we do have integrated printing. We have screen mirroring. Again, this is a toggle that's also available under quick settings. This allows you to mirror your display to a Samsung smart TV or any TV equipped with an all share cast device. We have our sound settings and this is where you can turn off any annoying notifications such as the touch sounds you keep hearing that nature UX touch sound. So as you can see, when I turn that off, you no longer get that blooping sound. When I enable it, you do get the blooping sound. Uh, so if you don't like that, there you go. That's where you can uh, change it. You can also change your ringtones, your vibration settings, notifications, etc., etc. So there's lots of options here. You also have your display, which includes adapt display. So if we go to adapt display, where is that? 
screen mode here. Adapt Display uses the sRGB sensor uh, on the front of the device to adapt the display to the conditions or the ambient light conditions. You can also set it to dynamic, standard, professional photo or cinema. You also have your screen timeout settings. You have Smart State technology, which again uh, monitors for the presence of your eyes, which you can toggle on and off here as well. Screen rotation, you can change your font as well as your brightness controls. And of course, brightness is also included in the drop down settings. We also have our wallpaper settings as well as your lock screen settings. And there's a few things here, including the uh, lock screen unlock effect. You can add another clock. You can change the clock size. You can show the date and time. Add the camera shortcut, which is on by default, but you can disable that if you prefer. Owner information, you can change the unlock effect. The one they're using by default is the popping colors effect, but you can use some of the other uh, older Samsung effects as well. We have multi-window mode, which you can toggle on and off if you prefer that not to come up when you accidentally press and hold the back button, which I often do. We also have the notification panel here, which allows you to change the settings. So for example, the notification panel includes the standard array of quick settings, and you have to press the other icon to see all of them. But you can rearrange these, so you can add these to the quick drop-down menu just by tapping and holding on any one of these and dragging them up here, and it bounces them out of the way. So for example, I think a feature I like to use the most would be power saving mode so I can put it right here instead of Wi-Fi hotspotting. So now if I go to my drop-down notification shade I can see power saving mode included with the quick setting toggles and I can see the rest by going right there. I can also edit directly from the screen by going to edit. It takes me again to that control panel where I can do the same thing and I can also reposition them if I want. You also have that toolbox feature, one-handed operation, which is very interesting, which I have turned on, that's off by default. But basically, in order to enable one-hand operation from the side you want to operate one-handed, all you have to do is swipe just like that. You swipe in and out. So let me do that again. That disables it. That enables it. And if you're left-handed, you do the same from the left edge and it's left justified. Now this one-handed operation also comes with some other features. So you can resize the window. If you tap up here, you get another dock, which you can also edit. So if you go to edit, you can select which apps you want here. You basically drag and drop apps to that dock. Click check. And then you can also go to full screen mode. You can go to your people. So you can see all your recent contacts. And then you can also change your volume. Go back home and your recent apps button. Now under personalization, you have easy mode. Now easy mode is kind of the grandma mode. So you get these three screens, you can add contacts for quick access to them. So you can create existing or add existing contacts or create new ones. You can see these quick widgets up here for weather, date and time, as well as access to your LED or your LED lights. So you can turn on your flashlight, which I actually find very useful. I wish that was kind of integrated under quick settings. You have your magnifier, so you can use this as your magnifier for reading your menus or whatever. Uh, you have your camera. You can see these icons are bolder. You have your phone app, your messaging app, your browser, gallery, email, etc., etc. And you can also add additional apps right here. So all the apps you have pre-installed, you can also add. And you can go to more apps to see all the ones that are not installed. Now under motion and gestures, we have some familiar options, including air browse. But basically, this will tell you exactly what that feature does. So you can swipe down above the device without touching it, left or right, up and down to navigate emails, to browse your gallery, to navigate through websites or scroll through websites on the internet. You also change your music, either in the music app or directly on the lock screen, all without touching the phone. You also have direct call. So when you're looking at a contact, all you have to do is raise your device to your ear and it will automatically call them. This also works under messaging. So if you're looking at a text message and you just want to call them, just lift it to your ear. I actually find that very useful. We also have smart alert. So basically, when you pick up the device and you have a notification, it will kind of vibrate for you. We also have mute slash pause. So we have several features that are on by default. The one that was on by default is covering the screen with your hand to mute it. And this tells you exactly what that means. Basically, if you cover the screen with your hand, that will mute phone calls or pause media. And then we also have turn the device over to mute calls or pause media. And then we have smart pause. You also have palm swipe to capture, which is also on by default. This is very useful. So this allows you to do a quick screen grab. So I can do this. I can, it's showing you to use the edge of your palm, which you can also do, but I can also just use my finger here like that. Now, AirView is another interesting feature here, which is off by default, but this allows you to, without touching your screen, hover your finger over the display to see, for example, calendar events under your calendar, uh, look at an expanded view of your gallery by hovering your finger over one of your gallery icons, scrub a video by hovering your finger over the playback scrubber. You can also see your speed dial contacts by hovering your finger over the 
phone dialer. Now this really only works in certain Samsung apps. So as you can see here, when I hover my finger over my email messages, it expands out for me and shows me an expanded preview of that message. So again, I'm not even touching the screen and it sees my finger. So you can see it's maybe within an inch of the display. And if I'm in my gallery, all I have to do is hover my finger over any one of these images to get a preview. Now under user and backup, we have our accounts. This is where we can add additional accounts such as Twitter, Facebook, our email accounts, Dropbox, Samsung accounts, and other Google accounts. You can see everything that's available here, including LDAP accounts for email, Microsoft Exchange accounts, Facebook Sync, and that sort of thing. We also have our cloud accounts, which includes Dropbox as well as Samsung. So this is all our cloud storage options. We also have backup and reset. Now under system, we have language and input settings. So this is where you can change your language, your keyboards, your voice search, that sort of thing. We also have date and time settings, which you can set automatically. You can select the format of the clock, that sort of thing. Now we also have safety assistance. This is where you can enable that emergency feature I talked about earlier. So uh, you do have to specify a emergency contact, which I'm not gonna do right now. I just wanna show you how this works. So under emergency mode, if you enable this, basically it dials back performance of the device to kind of the ultra power saving mode. Uh, so it preserves the battery life, allows you to make phone calls for an extended period of time, send messages, that sort of thing. So make sure your phone doesn't die too early. So if you're in an emergency and can't charge it, you enable that mode and it saves your battery life. You also have Geo News, which is off by default. I toggled this on, but basically this will warn you of weather events in your area. So it'll bring up pop-up pop messages and notifications and that sort of thing. Uh, we also have Send Help Messages, which is very interesting here. So if you enable this, if you have a primary emergency contact and you double or triple press the home button, it will send a text message with a quick alert to your primary contacts when you're in an emergency situation. So it will send pictures and send a sound recording as well as your current location. You also have your accessories. So this is where you can change your audio output. So if you want surround sound, you can do that as well. Uh, we also have our battery. Now in terms of battery life, I've had a really good uh, experience so far. I've been able to get about 17 hours out of battery uh, with a comfortable margin. Uh, so 17 hours out of a day of normal use, so that's moderate use, that's using cellular and Wi-Fi and checking my phone regularly. So 17 hours is pretty good. I maybe get 10 hours out of an iPhone. This is very similar to the performance on an HTC One M8. We can also take a look at our storage and see what's taking up all of our space. So you can see out of the 16 gigs, I'm using about half of it. Now under security, we have a feature here that I wanna highlight here, which is called reactivation lock. So basically you use your Samsung account to prevent other people from reactivating your device. So if you enable this, it gives you some peace of mind. All right, next up is the camera app, which is really full featured. So of course we have tap to focus. And as you can see, it's pretty quick to respond. It's much slower in low light conditions. Uh, but otherwise, it's really quick. You can pinch in and out to zoom, which is just digital cropping, of course. Uh, we can shoot our photograph, and we can record video all on the same screen. We can shoot a photograph while we're recording video. We can pause video recording, resume it, and stop it. You can also change your mode here. So they've given us the standard array of auto, beauty face, shot and more, panorama, virtual tour, dual camera, and you can download additional modes, which come from the Samsung App Store. So not all of them are included like they have been before. So animated photo, sound and shot, sports shot and surround shot. Now virtual tour is kind of new here. I can't really demonstrate it live, but basically this allows you to kind of create a virtual tour of let's say a house or a building. Basically you can walk around and it will automatically take photos for you. And once you're done with that, you can actually navigate through that virtual tour. Now, if you look on the left side, we have our quick settings. So that includes the ability to switch from the front facing to the rear facing camera. There I am everybody and then I can switch back. Uh, I also have HDR. So HDR, you can enable or disable quickly here. Now you also have selective focus, which you can enable or disable, and I'll show you exactly how this works. Now I took this image with selective focus turned on. So as you can see, I have a foreground subject and I have a background. So I have enough distance between the background and the foreground subject for this feature to work. Now, if you don't have a clear subject, the camera will tell you they couldn't enable this feature. But with this photo, I can go up to this little edit icon up here. And now I have the option to select near focus, which is focusing the object closest to the camera, far focus, which is focusing on the background. So as you can see, blur the foreground and I can do pan focus. So we'll focus both uh, the background and foreground. Now, basically all it's doing is applying a filter. In fact, if you zoom really closely at the edges of the foreground subject, you can see they actually kind of blur. 
Uh, so you can see it's not perfect. Now we also have our settings panel, which is pretty packed here, which includes both our still camera as well as our video camera settings, which is kind of nice, quick access to everything. And you can also modify this panel or this dock here for all these settings. So if you tap and hold any one of them, you can drag them to the dock here and remove them if you want. You're only limited to a certain number of them, so you do have to remove one if you want to add another one. So for example, if I drop this in here, try to drop another one in here, it bumps it out of the way. So of course we have our picture size, so we can change it from 16 megapixels all the way down to 2.4 megapixels. We can enable burst shot picture stabilization, which is off by default, you can enable that. Face detection, metering modes, as you can see we have center weighted matrix or spot metering. Uh, tap to take a picture, so if you enable this, when you tap to take the photograph, it will, or tap to focus, it will take the photograph. You also have video size, so you can select 4K video recording. I'm not gonna demonstrate 4K video recording in this video, but I'll link one to a great one that TLD Today shot, John at TLD Today shot a fantastic 4K video sample with a GS5 and I'll post that in the description below. But at the end of the video, I will demonstrate the full 1080p experience because I did shoot this video with 1080p. Now under recording mode, you have things like slow motion, fast motion, and smooth motion options there as well. Video stabilization, which is off by default. This uses software for stabilization, not optical image stabilization, which is not included in here. You also have audio zooming. So you can enable this or turn it off. Basically, it will increase the sensitivity of the microphone the closer you get to a subject when you zoom in. Now there's another unique feature here called Remote Viewfinder, which will coach you through the process of setting this up. I actually use NFC technology to enable this feature on the GS4. So basically what's happening now is the GS4 is seeing the screen of the GS5. So I can now take my GS5, place the place it anywhere, so I can place it in a window, and I can use the GS4 to control it. So let me go ahead and demonstrate that. All right, so there you go, it's in my window. I can tap to focus. I can see my neighbors driving by. I can record video, snap a photograph. I can even change the settings. So all those controls are right here on a, uh, a remote viewfinder. Now in terms of camera performance, this definitely is one of the best cameras I've used to date with very sharp, high resolution images, and you can get pretty close. So this, for example, this flower was really close to the camera. I was able to really get close here to see all the details. I mean, I can really dig down here. So that resolution definitely comes in handy, and the quality of the images is superb. So you see a lot of detail here, and it's sharp, and it focuses sharp. It has no problem focusing. So it's done a really nice job finding the right focus point. And I didn't have to do much here. I just took the photo, allowed it to find the focus point, and it did a really nice job. So definitely one of the best cameras I've used, especially on an Android device. Now in terms of low light performance, this camera is also really impressive. I think the only real problem I have with it is that it's pretty slow to focus. So it has a harder time focusing in low light conditions. As you can see, it does a pretty nice job. It's not too overexposed and grainy, so it's just about right. Now I think the biggest weakness with this camera is the LED flash. So for example, I took these shots at nighttime, and then I took some shots with the LED LED flash. So as you can see, it does a nice job illuminating the scene, but the flash is really unnatural. It's got this blue washed out light. Definitely doesn't look good. It kind of clashes with the light in the scene. And so it doesn't look natural at all. Cameras with dual LED flashes that have two different colors are able to create a much more natural looking light that adapts to the scene. In the Samsung's case, it's just a bright blue light. You can see with this uh, violet here, it actually looks okay, not too bad. But again, with the scenes with more complex lighting conditions, it's definitely not as good. Now the GS5 has definitely improved upon the GS4's display. It's much brighter, the whites are more clearer. You still have that cool color temperature of the OLED display, but it's not quite as saturated. It's a little more color accurate. It seems to be almost brighter than the LCD display on the HTC One M8. So the OLED displays are getting up there in terms of their brightness. This is about 440 nits. Now something like the iPhone 5S seems to be a bit brighter. Uh, than the GS5. So this is a little around 600 nits, so this is still a brighter display. But in terms of large displays, this is definitely one of the best looking ones. Now in terms of pixel density, we're dealing with 432 pixels per inch. So even the smallest text is pen sharp. So you're gonna have no problem reading text on this device. Now in terms of benchmarking with the GS5 achieving 960 on the single core score and 3149 on the multi-core score, it pretty much wipes out the GS4. In terms of benchmark performance, so you can see there's a lot of hardware or processing power behind the GS5. This also beats the uh, HTC One M8. Uh, this is running a Snapdragon 801 processor 
overclocked at 2.3 gigahertz. This is running that Exynos processor, but this also is equipped with the Snapdragon 801 processor clocked at 2.5 gigahertz. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that scores against that device. But you can see with the Exynos processor, it's pretty impressive. Now, as you can see here, we have the iPhone, which does pretty well, uh, certainly better on the single core score, but not as well on the multi-core score. All right, so let's try out some gaming performance here. So performance is very smooth, graphics look great, especially on this display. Now let's take a listen to the audio quality and compare it to that of the HTC One M8. Now, in conclusion, let's quickly talk about the pros and cons of the GS5 as I see it. So we have this beautiful 5.1 inch Super AMOLED display, which is one of the best OLED displays Samsung has put out. It's bright and vivid. It's right up there with other high-end LCD screens while retaining that nice deep contrast, those deep blacks that come with OLED. So a bright display that looks great outdoors, more accurate color reproduction, certainly a big improvement over the GS4, and it's really the first time I've been really enthusiastic about an OLED display. We also get traditional Android keys, so I'm really glad to see a recent apps button as opposed to a menu button, because I'm always using that to get to the recent apps, and before it was a slow process, you had to use the slow press of one of the other buttons to bring it up. You also have really useful software features for me, such as S Finder. S Finder used to be kind of hidden, but now it's right on the surface here, so you can quickly search the device for apps and that sort of thing, right from the drop down menu. And we have Google Now integration right on the home screen. So we could say, okay, Google, set an appointment for tomorrow at eight o'clock to get this review done. Touch to continue. So the experience is actually somewhat similar to the Nexus 5. So it's nice to see that finally integrated here. And of course we have IP67 certification, which means this phone is pretty life proof. You don't have to worry about water or dust destroying this phone. So it's really nice to have it without having an ugly phone, like say the Galaxy S4 Active, which had physical buttons and didn't look as slick as the standard GS4. And we also have pretty decent performance for a TouchWiz device. It's not as quick and slick as something like a Nexus 5 device, but it's definitely an improvement over the GS4. So overall, I'm pretty impressed here. And I definitely like the changes to the user interface, which is now much cleaner, especially the settings panel which integrates search which I find very useful. We also have that excellent 16 megapixel camera which can deliver sharp and predictable results under any conditions with pretty sharp focus and quick focus with lots of features that actually work. We also have 4k video recording which is really nice to have around. We also have the heart rate monitor which works really well and I actually find it very useful. And all this comes in a lightweight compact and thin form factor. So although this phone is pretty large at 5.1 inches, it feels very comfortable to handle. I can reach across the display without reaching too far or without loosening my grip on the phone. So it seems to be about the perfect size, the perfect weight and the perfect thinness. Now, when it comes to the cons of this device, it really comes down to audio and build and construction quality, which is a double edged sword. Now with audio, I don't really like the earpiece. It's kind of muffled. It's not very clear sounding and it's a little quieter than I'd like to see. Certainly something like the HCC one M8 has a really loud earpiece, which is really clear. Audio is also very poor on this device with that single mono speaker on the back. Definitely one of the worst sounding phones and it fires toward the back. So I'm really disappointed with the audio quality of this phone and I definitely think Samsung has to improve this. But of course the speaker is waterproof, unlike the other high-end speakers. So that adds to the IP67 certification. Same with the earpiece here. So maybe that 
does come with some sacrifice, that waterproof technology, uh, but definitely audio is an issue here. But if you want good audio, just connect your headphones because the headphone amp is pretty good. Now, the other con here is design and materials. While I think the device is well made, it's well put together, it's rigid and solid, doesn't creak or anything like that. But unfortunately, plastics in a world where high-end phones are made out of glass and metal feel a little low-end and also feel a little too familiar. This is a very familiar experience from Samsung devices. It doesn't feel as exciting and exotic as something like the all-metal HTC One M8 or the all-glass Sony Xperia Z2. Uh, but for me, that comes with some benefits. It's thin and lightweight, fairly durable. Durable. It's more real world resistant to drops and that sort of thing. So I feel a little more comfortable using this device as opposed to something that's made out of glass and metal. And of course the back panel pops off really easily so you can quickly change out the battery, change your SIM and uh, add your micro SD card slot all without adding doors and that sort of thing on the device. Now for the record, I'm not a big fan of the My Magazine feature, mostly because I'm disappointed that it doesn't work as well as the feature on their tablets, which have interactive live tiles. These basically just feed the top story and you have to tap on it to get to it. You can't actually interact, you can't swipe in the tile or anything like that, so I find it less useful. And something like Blink Feed on the HTC One M8 is a lot more powerful and a lot more interactive. So this is probably a feature I would just turn off. All right, so that is my review of the Galaxy S5. Please stay tuned for some camera samples. And remember, take a look at the description for a link to a great 4K video shot by John at TLD today. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you again in the next one. All right, guys, Mike here, the Detroit Borg, testing out the front-facing camera of the Galaxy S5. Again, this is 2 megapixels, good for 1080p video at 30 frames per second. You actually can take photos while recording video just like you can with the rear main camera. So there's a lot of features also built into this camera. It does a pretty good job and also gives you an idea of the audio pickup quality. All right, guys, so now it's time to test out the rear main camera. Again, 16 megapixels, and this video camera is capable of recording video in 4K. So there is Zoe and Chloe sunbathing. That's their favorite thing to do. All right, so let's go outside. It's a bright, sunny day and get some footage out there.